Church family. Our reading for today is Luke chapter 14, verses 28 through 34. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Well, thank you, Carol, for reading scripture for us this morning. It has been a full week of news and events. And I don't know how this week was for you, but you maybe found yourself feeling pretty inundated with information, uh, maybe agitated at certain points. Maybe this week you were restless or anxious. Uh, maybe you had to tell yourself to not check the news so often or to, to just put down your phone. Uh, I know I did. And, and when I would do that, I was so grateful to then find this book just waiting to speak peace over all of the noise. You know, to, to open these pages and to find here a greater perspective, um, to, to hear words of life and peace right from the mouth of God. And isn't it good that we are anchored in God's word? It gives us such footing and such foundation for the rest of life. Well, the other thing about this week is we had this unusual grace of 75 degrees in November. And I just felt like it was, it was such a gift. It was amazing. And I don't know about you, but, but maybe you found yourself having to scurry around outside and finish up all those things that were ambushed by snow in October. So garden hoses were still out there, leaves, last minute lawn mowings. You were busy like little field mice, maybe, uh, getting ready for winter. That's what it felt like in our neighborhood. I even saw one guy, I, I couldn't see, I couldn't hear him, but I could see him. Uh, it looked like he was whistling as he was hanging up Christmas lights in a t-shirt. And <laughs> I thought that, that's how good this week is. Well, we've got the scripture passage about finishing what we've started a passage about counting the cost and then carrying it through to completion. And I bet every one of us knows these two different scenarios and, and how you feel. On the one hand, when you complete a project and you have that sense of accomplishment. And then a, a different scenario where you've got a project like half done and then for whatever reason, it just, it sits there for days or weeks or longer, and it's just staring back at you, begging to be finished. Uh, some of you are, I know, trying to teach these lessons to your kids right now, and, and it can be an uphill battle. So you might say to your, to your kid, hey, um, could you clean your room? I mean, it's, it's a pigsty in there. Doesn't that bother you? And they might say, um, no, not really. <laughs> I, Lennox gave me permission to share this story with you. Uh, it was just this week, and I said, I said, Lennox, I think you're due for a shower. Why, why don't you go take a shower? And he looked at me and said, Dad, I took a shower last week. <laughs> like, apparently, he's on this every other week shower schedule right now. You know, he doesn't want to overdo it. Well, we all know the reality of unfinished business, of having started something, but not finishing it yet. Good intentions, but then real life distractions and other commitments come along the way. These are the things that characterize our scripture passage for today. But instead of to-do lists and chores at home, the nature of the matter is following Jesus. Today is about discipleship. We're in the last couple of weeks in our fall message series called The Doctor is In, Discipleship in Luke. And all fall, we've been studying these passages in Luke that are unique to Luke among the four Gospels. So these are some of the things that only Luke reports on. And these two little pictures of the tower and the king are included only in Luke. But before we get there, 
I'd like to start out studying this passage by actually looking at the wider context and include some of the verses that come right before this. Uh, these verses that we're going to look at first are not unique to Luke, but they're really vital in our understanding of the tower and the king. So back up with me. If you have your Bible in front of you, um, go up to verse 25, where the narrative of this passage begins. And it says, large crowds were traveling with Jesus. So Jesus is on a journey on foot that will ultimately lead him south to Jerusalem, where he'll be arrested, tried, and hung on a cross. And on this journey, he starts calling uh, people to, to, to join him. And it starts off really rather small. First, he finds uh, these fishermen who are cleaning their nets, and he calls them to follow him. And and then some more join in, and, and there's a, a guy named Matthew who's a tax collector, and, and Matthew leaves behind his tax booth and follows Jesus. And pretty soon we see Jesus traveling around with what we call his 12 disciples. But it doesn't stop there. Jesus speaks and heals and travels, and there are more and more people who are traveling with him. Large crowds, it says. There's this whole movement, this whole traveling Jesus movement with masses of people that are underway. And yet what he says next is hardly the thing that you'd expect of someone who's trying to gain followers. It says large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Another reason I wanted to start our study here is that um, some might think that I intentionally skipped over the hard part. And at first blush, this is a hard saying of Jesus. I have never seen this verse in calligraphy on a greeting card, that's for sure. But I hope that when we run into something that is hard to understand, and, and I'm speaking for myself here, that when we run into something in the Bible that we don't understand, that we would neither rush to judgment, nor gloss over it really quickly, nor take offense, nor miss the opportunity to dig deeper. For me, I do two things. First, I ask the Lord to help me understand. And then second, I go and ask someone who is just further down the road than I am, who, who knows more about these things, either in person and or a, a trustworthy book or article. You know, there's people in my life who I, I know and care about deeply who can make all kinds of dismissive claims about the Bible. Though, listen to this, they have never actually read it and put in the time. But personally, I have never been failed by this, that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, even when I at first don't understand it. So what is Jesus saying here when he tells his followers that they have to hate their moms and dads and spouses and kids and siblings? Uh, you have to wonder if some of these people in, the, in this large crowd were there in Luke 6 when Jesus had said, love your enemies. This is a very peculiar message indeed if we're supposed to love our enemies but hate our families. What is Jesus saying? Well, what he's not talking about is an actual hatred of loved ones. Now, maybe you, you knew that, you sensed that. Uh, maybe you were wondering what he means. Maybe in the past you've glossed over this uncomfortable passage. But you can definitely rule that out. That's not what he's saying. If you were looking for a verse so you could get out of dealing with your difficult relatives, uh, you're going to have to keep looking. Now, what Jesus is really talking about here is what you and I love the most. Your first love. He's talking about your greatest affection, your ultimate priority. One of my favorite things to do is to play sports. Pretty much a sport of any kind, and I am interested to get in the game. So playing pickup basketball here in the gym behind me, uh, I love to do that. Even better than, than basketball at the Y would be for me to be out playing softball on our church team in the city league. And this year we had a great season. We actually just finished last Tuesday 
after a long snow delay in October, uh, we finally got back at it and we finished third place in the city league. It was just a great season and a great group of guys. Uh, another thing that I love to do is after church is all cleaned up to play football with the kids in the gym. And sometimes I have to remind myself, you no, know, first we have to clean up and then I can go toss the ball with the kids. So those are some of the things I love to do. But, but if you want to see me like a kid in a candy shop, just yelling my head off and having the time of my life, then hands down, what I love to do more than anything else is to play boot hockey. Eight o'clock Saturday mornings down at the hanky pit, stick on the ice. That is what I love. In fact, I love it so much that those other things really just pale in comparison to my love for hockey. Do you understand a little bit what Jesus is saying in this passage? There are large crowds following him because they're curious, because they like some of the things that he has said, because following him is kind of this popular thing to do right now, because they definitely like seeing miracles, because they like his agenda, or at least what they think his agenda will be. And Jesus whirls around on his heel and he says to the crowd, if anyone comes to me and doesn't hate his own family or his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And I imagine these words put a chill through the crowd. Jesus puts it in such jarring terms too, doesn't he? And, and this is in a strong group culture where family was everything. I mean, you, you lived and died by the honor of your family. So, so in their culture, nobody ever asked, uh, what do you want to be when you grow up? The question that they asked was, who is your family? We live in an individualistic culture. They lived in a collective one where your family network was the ultimate value. So here we have Jesus turning to the crowd following him. And he says, if your relationship with me is not your ultimate value, if it is not your first love and your greatest affection, then you cannot be my disciple. And then as if that wasn't strong enough, he adds verse 27, where it says, and whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. The crowds who Jesus said this to were, were very familiar with, with this kind of picture. Uh, the Romans who ruled over them had perfected crucifixion as a method of execution. And even to the point that they would extract social humiliation in the process. So if a person was to be crucified, the Romans showed up and gave them the horizontal beam of their cross for them to carry through town to their death. Jesus equates following him with carrying a cross. As one old commentary put it, following Jesus is no invitation to an ice cream social. And it is these sobering words that lead us to the picture of the tower and the king. The first picture Jesus gives is of someone who is wanting to build a tower. Now, it could be a watchtower for a vineyard or a, a protective tower that would be a part of a, a fence or a gate by a house. Now, I've been a, in a couple places in the world where they actually have these around residential housing. You, you would find walls with barbed wire on the top and then gatehouses and guards that that watch it all night long and, and that's the picture here this is someone who wants to build a tower for their property uh, and and maybe in our context we'd be thinking more of something like building a, a pole shed or a new addition on the house and and jesus says won't you first sit down and estimate the cost and see if you have enough money to complete it this is what he's inviting the crowd to do. Uh, he's asking them to, to sit down and estimate the cost of discipleship, the cross-bearing, the, the priority setting, the finishing. He's saying, first reflect on what this commitment looks like and what it will take to see it through. Because you don't want to be the guy with a, a half-built pole barn in his backyard. And you don't want to be the person who's got a new addition going, but then it's at a standstill because you didn't do the math on the materials. Jesus says, don't lay a foundation for what you're not able to finish. 
He doesn't desire crowds of, of fair weather followers and curious onlookers. Jesus is looking for committed disciples, people who have counted the cost and are ready by the grace of God to bear their cross all the way to Jerusalem. The decision to follow Christ is one that demands sober reflection and a firm commitment. Otherwise, you won't make it. When I meet with a couple for premarital sessions, one of the things that you want to hear them saying in some way, in their own words, is we have discerned this together before the Lord, and we are ready to commit to one another for life. That is the message that you want to hear from a couple who is engaged and walking towards their wedding day, because that's what they're going to say in their marriage ceremony. Till death do us part. We have thought this through, and we are ready and committed all the way to the end. Even Elvis Presley intuitively knew this in that song. He would sing, wise men say, only fools rush in. Now, the rest of the song you can probably forget for uh, anything worthwhile, but it is a good song. And that's how it begins. Wise men say, only fools rush in. So picture number one is about coming to Christ and counting the cost. That's picture number one. Picture number two is about following after Christ and submitting everything else. That's the picture of the king going to war. Jesus says, suppose there's a king and he's going to war against another king. But the first king only has 10,000 troops, whereas the second king, he has 20,000. Jesus says, don't you think that he would first sit down and consider the odds? And if he does his math properly, don't you think that he won't send out his diplomats instead and secure a treaty? Sounds like a wise king to me. I mean, he's not going to send his men against an army he knows that they can't defeat. To start a war, he knows they can't win. No, they might as well surrender their cause and make peace. And then Jesus gives the punchline in verse 33. He says, in the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. You see, commitment to Jesus calls for everything calls for everything. A footnote in my Bible this week, in my study Bible, said this, the essence of being a disciple of Christ is unreserved commitment to him, holding loosely the things of this world. You see, the picture of the tower is about counting the cost, and the picture of the king is about surrendering everything else that would get in the way. Jesus calls for everything. William Booth was the founder of the Salvation Army way back in 1865. Uh, you and I probably have to think about the Salvation Army in a, in a different way than just the secondhand store across town here in Elk River. Um, but to really understand the Salvation Army, you have to understand their history. It started in London, similar to the YMCA, where William Booth left traditional church ministry to take the gospel directly to the poor, to the hungry, to the homeless. So he and his wife, Catherine, uh, would just walk the streets of London, taking care of people's physical needs and telling them about Jesus. And God was on the move. I mean, as they did this, all kinds of people were responding. People from all different backgrounds were receiving the gospel and being transformed by Christ. Prostitutes and street criminals, drunks and addicts, and then they would join William and Catherine in the streets, singing and sharing their testimony. By the 10-year mark, William Booth had over a 1,000 volunteers and evangelists working alongside him. By the 15-year mark, hundreds of thousands of people were turning to Christ across the British Isles. By the 20-year mark, the Salvation Army had spread to the rest of, of Europe, North America, Australia, India, and South Africa, and today the Salvation Army exists in over a hundred countries where it shares the hope and healing of Christ with all those in need. There was a reporter who asked William Booth later in his life, said, Mr. Booth, what is the secret to your success? What is the secret behind the Salvation Army? 
To which Booth said this, I will tell you the secret. God has had all of me. He went on to say, there have been men with greater brains than I, men with greater opportunities. But from the day I got the poor of London on my heart and caught a vision of all Jesus Christ could do with them, on that day I made up in my mind that God would have all of William Booth there was. And if there is anything of power in the Salvation Army today, it is because God has had all the adoration of my heart, all the power of my will, and all the influence of my life. I want you to imagine that you're on the road with that large crowd following Jesus, and he has turned to ask you these things. Have you sat down to count the cost? Are you ready to bear your cross? And are you ready to surrender everything? That's a hard message, isn't it? You know, we thought just the, the first part about family was tough, but, but this whole thing is hard because it's so total and complete, the cost of discipleship. You cannot give your life to Christ and yet parcel out a few square inches where you will remain king and call the shots. That's not how it works. You, you cannot stack Christ alongside all of your other commitments and priorities and call it good. No, everything else must be set down. Right before this passage is the parable of the great banquet. Jesus tells the story there of a man who is having a banquet and sending out invitations. But when the guests start receiving their invitations, uh, they keep coming up with excuses about why they couldn't attend. The first one says that he's just bought a piece of property and, and then he needs to go inspect it. The, the second one says that he's just bought some oxen and he really needs to go give them a test drive out in the fields. The, the third person receiving the invitation says, you know, I just got married and so the timing just isn't great and, and I'll have to pass. Do you see the connection to our passage before us now? They appreciated the invitation. And under other circumstances, certainly they would have attended, but they just had so many other priorities that they were tagging along with them. What is getting in the way of your commitment to follow Jesus? What other competing priorities are you holding on to right now? I think that the people in that large crowd following Jesus were a lot like you and me. They wanted to follow Jesus, but they just had a lot of extra luggage that they were trying to carry down the road with them. I'll be the first to tell you, I have a tendency to overpack. I guess I just think I like to be prepared for anything. So even up in the deer stand yesterday morning, I'm realizing, why did I bring all this stuff with me? I mean, I, I don't need half of it. But there I was, you know, struggling up this tiny little metal ladder up into my tree stand. I got my gun in one hand and and the seat cushion, and then this backpack that's just jammed full of stuff. And I'm, I'm clambering up into this tree and probably looked more like a bear that was crawling into hibernation. Why did I bring all that stuff? Jesus is saying to the crowd that day on the road, why are you bringing all of that stuff? And I believe it's the same question that he poses to you and I today. The missionary Jim Elliott when the 1950s gave his life in the jungles of Ecuador as a missionary, wrote this statement in his journal. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. And that's really the math that makes sense. By giving up what you cannot keep and gaining what you could never lose. Trusting in Jesus above everything else in your life. Following after him one day at a time. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, your invitation to follow you is so gracious. We think of words in the Gospels where you said, Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. 
Lord, your invitation is so gracious and yet, yet also so direct and uncompromising. And on our own, we know that we struggle under the weight of all these other affections and responsibilities and priorities. And Lord, would you help us to set those things aside so that our heart has room to be fully devoted to you. And if any of us have not yet made that commitment to follow you, I pray, Lord, that today would be the day. And for all of us who desire to follow you, Lord, would you help us to finish what we've started? For your glory and in your name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing another worship song, and then I'll be back to finish the service. <laughs>